Now that we've talked about how an observation may be an outlier, both with regard to our covariates as well as our outcome, we can now combine the two to try to figure out how to measure influence. And so we're going to say that a point with high leverage that has the potential to greatly influence the fitted model doesn't necessarily mean that it has a large studentized residual, right? They may not necessarily happen at the same time. So if it does happen to be the case that it's an outlier with regard to both the covariates and the outcome, that that's going to actually greatly influence the model probably. So having high leverage and having large studentized residuals means that an observation is likely going to have high influence. And we're going to talk about different ways of assessing influence, but one of the first ways is that we can leave one out deletion again by deleting an observation and then seeing how much the fitted regression coefficients change. And we're going to call that just a difference in betas approach. And a large change would then suggest that it has high influence. So let's try and do that where, again, we're checking the difference in the betas based on running the regression with and without each observation. And the way that we're going to look at the difference is we'll take the difference over the standard error of the beta in the regression without that observation. So the difference in these betas is the effect of the ith observation on a single estimated coefficient. Therefore, if the absolute value of the difference in betas is larger than one, we'll consider that to be large difference if we have like a small or a medium sized sample. And again, if we have a larger sample, then our criteria may be different. And so the criteria for the absolute value would have to be greater than two times whatever the number of observations to uh, negative uh, one half power. And again, these are so arbitrary that I hate even putting up these characteristics, but this is something that you may run across and what is typically going to be used as the criteria. And so I just want to present that to you. A more principled approach that actually takes into account the two different measures that we looked at, our hat values and our studentized residuals, is a combination of the two, and that's a Cook's distance. And really, again, what this is, is it's looking at what the hat value is relative to other hat values, as well as the studentized residuals relative to others. So again, Cook's distance is the effect of the ith observation on all the other fitted values. So this really is telling us how influential a given observation is in comparison to the others. And again, Cook's distance can be high if one or two of these things is large. So it can be large if you have a large hat value, so it's very close to one and if your student ties residual is moderate or large. Or if <clears throat> your student ties residual is very large and your hat value is moderate, then it's going to be large. Or if they're both extreme, it's going to be large. And the threshold or criteria that we usually grade Cook's distances by is approximately 4 divided by n minus k minus 1. And again, if it has a value greater than that, it is likely providing undue influence on other observations and altering our fitted model. We can very easily get these different measures by using the influence measures function in R. And again, this is gonna give us our DF betas as well as our Cook's distance, our hat values, etc. Now, again, you can get a DF beta for each regression coefficient and each observation. A bivariate plot of the other DF betas may be useful. Usually we're not interested in the DF beta for the intercept though. Now, I don't wanna to concentrate too much on just getting them. I think it's useful to plot them as well. And so we can just plot DF betas. That's what we're doing in the first line. And again, 
I'm just clicking on some that may be larger than others. Now, what we can see here is that the minister observation may have a large impact on both the regression coefficients. Again, using that kind of greater than one threshold. We can also look at our Cook's distances in R. Again, we can just do that and access it by using cooks.distance with our LM object. And here I'm just plotting what our kind of threshold or um, criteria for having an extreme hat value would be. And again, just clicking on some Cook's distances that may be large. We again can see that ministers has a large hat value. To bring it all together, we can construct a bubble plot which allows us to look at the hat values leverage. It allows us to look at student ties residuals as well as the combination of the two with Cook's distance. So what's really nice is that again, we can access these things in R using hat values in R student. Then we can get Cook's distance. I'm just calculating it here and taking the square root. Then I'm plotting those points in line three and using line four and five to create thresholds for our criteria. And again, in line six, just pointing out some uh, potentially undue or influential observations. And what we can see here again, and I'm gonna go back to remind you exactly that the hat values are on the X axis and the student ties residuals are on the Y. So what we can see is again, minister and RR have both large hat values as well as large student ties residuals, which would indicate that they have large Cook's distances, which you can see by the size of the circle. So again, I hope that's really driving this point home. The high leverage jobs, conductor, minister, R and R, are also some of the ones that have large student ties residuals, although R and R doesn't, right? You can see based on the size of the circle for minister and conductor that that's the case. In fact, minister has the highest influence on the fitted model, again, because it has high leverage, large hat values, as well as large student ties residuals.